Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a deep dive into what might be the best glow up in the entire series as we go over Jayavarman the 7th and the Kumai Empire. Before we get started, don't forget to like this video if you find it helpful or consider subscribing to my channel. It really helps me out and I'm working my way up to a thousand uh, and you can help me get there. If you do enjoy it, there are plenty of other guides on the channel and if you're already subscribed and you're already watching all those other videos, please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about this if I always enjoy reading those comments down below and I'd like to see more discussion in these videos as people come to see what they think about their sieves here. The Kamai are a religious and cultural powerhouse who are pretty much unstoppable once you get a strong foundation set up. And this is due to three out of their four unique bonuses. First, the Grand Beret ability gives you extra food, amenities, and faith if your city is located next to rivers. One amenity from an aqueduct, so essentially Rome's unique district. One faith per population if the city has an aqueduct, so already better than Rome's unique district. Two food to farms next to aqueducts, which is usually much more useful than the Incan Terrace farm. And plus one faith for farms next to holy sites, so if you get a farm between an aqueduct and a holy site, which you're incentivized to do as the Kamai, you're going to get... Two food, one faith extra on top of those farms. Imagine setting up a triangle of farms or a farming triangle in between an aqueduct and a holy site. You're going to end up with plus six uh, food plus three faith on top of their already base yields. So this is just, just amazing yields on the map, which is my favorite part of Civ anyway. So much food and faith packed into the Civ ability, you're really encouraged to get aqueducts which provide housing, you're encouraged to put farms all around these aqueducts and benefit from tons of faith from your population. Now this would be pretty nuts by itself, population drives most things in this game, but this isn't even considering Jayavarman's ability. Monasteries of the King gives holy sites, the best district in the game, plus two faith if built next to a river. Food equal to the holy site adjacency, two housing to help with all that population, and a culture bomb for finishing the holy site. And this is one of the few culture bombs left in the game. The first wave of DLCs, for whatever reason, Poland, Australia, Kamai, all had culture bombs involved inside of them. And once Rise and Fall came out, they really started to dry up and disappear. There's not that many culture bombs left over in the game. This culture bomb is much more useful than Poland's because holy sites are better than encampments and you, you usually build more holy sites than you build encampments. So from your cities with holy sites and aqueducts, you're going to be getting housing, amenities, faith, food, improved farms, combine this with work ethic and, you can, and the two holy site cards and you will have huge production out of these things and if you add your unique building Prasat onto this you get plus six faith and one culture for every two population in the city. So not only that, once your city hits 10 population, which is going to happen crazy early with all this food that you're getting, you're going to get 10 tourism. 20 population will give you 20 tourism. And now this is insane. You're getting tourism earlier than almost every other civ in the game besides Magnificent Catherine, who sucks, and Ludwig, who came out later. So from your holy sites, you are getting culture, faith, food, production, housing, amenities, and tourism. So if you have holy sites and you have aqueducts, you are getting every yield except for science and gold in the game for two districts. No other civilization does this. And this is just, it shows you how powerful these yields tied to districts really are in this game. So. Yes, you're encouraged to play tall, and this is one of the few civs that are encouraged to play tall, but again, the more holy sites, <laughs> the more tall cities you have, there's no malice to having cities in this game like there were in CF5. So you're encouraged to go wide tall, which just blows up the game. The game doesn't have any way to deal with the yields that you're going to have. The Domre, the last thing, a unique treb, is alright. It sucks at killing units, but it absolutely devastates cities. But I find that I don't use them very often. Uh, not unless I'm really boxed in as Jayavarman. Otherwise, I really don't war at all. 
the Kamaya require a really solid starting 20 turns because you're going all in on a religious rush. You are not worth very much without a religion, although it your holy site bonuses are not tied to the religion, but I find that that work ethic bonus really makes everything just fall into place. You need to beeline holy sites ASAP. Start with a scout and then a slinger to explore and get protection and then follow your starting river and look for a potential second city, hopefully next to some mountains to get even more adjacency on those holy sites. You want to spread out and utilize all of your tiles with massive population cities, so don't be packing your cities in very close. With your first Pantheon, go for River Goddess for more housing and amenities, since you will be placing all of your holy sites on rivers if possible, and River Goddess is not a very contested Pantheon, so it's easy to get, unless somehow you're able to get Religious Settlements, which is always the best one because it's the free settler. Play greedy and get your second city fast. For my governor, I always go for Magnus because I don't need Pingala, but I do need better uh, settlers. Get your holy site out and get it chopped and move Magnus to your second city and chop it there as well if possible. Settle on a luxury, sell it to the AI to afford a builder, or play super crazy greedy by going scout slinger builder settler <laughs> and have no defense to barbs. Once you secure your religion, it's almost always possible to get work ethic, and now your cities are supercharged. If you get uh, the, what is it, cross-cultural dialogue, the one that gives you science, I think, maybe for all your followers of your religion, boom, now your holy sites are offering you a way to get even more science. Or uh, tithe will get you gold, so you'll get almost all the yields in the game from your holy sites. Food, faith, production, and eventually culture and tourism all coming from one district is super overpowered and it's insane. Get as many cities as possible, take cities with Dalmere if you must, and you're just going to roll over the game. Just steam rolling everything. Nothing can hold up to what you're able to do here. The Kamai are amazing at cultural victories, and it's my favorite way to play them. You really only need theater districts and holy sites. Uh, you'll probably be getting a lot of relics off of your apostles. You can easily build culture wonders with your work ethic. Uh, and you're going to be generating so much culture you'll get them before any other Civ that's in the game aside from like Ludwig or Pericles. I always love going for Angkor Wat as uh, Jayavarman. It's one of the few Civ leaders that I go for Angkor Wat with because I have all the housing and amenities that I need off of my holy sites and my aqueducts. And I find that it's not a very contested wonder and it just gets me like over the line for that tourism bonus in some of my cities. You're going to have all the faith that you need to purchase naturalists and you're not going to be building that many mines since your holy sites are so good. So you can build a lot of natural parks and wonders. Not to mention infinite rock band spam from your massive faith production and your Prasad tourism bonus coming in so early that you can start overtaking sieves pretty early in the game. Religion is also super easy, I just don't prefer the gameplay style of sending out wave after wave of missionaries and apostles. You do have so much faith and so much population pressures that cities will flip to your religion and it's hard for civs to take out your religion. You're going to have infinite missionary spam because of all of your crazy amounts of faith, so 10 out of 10 for this as well. Science is feasible, but it's not preferred. You get a ton of production, your population will be producing science, but it fills against the flavor of the sieve, so I'm not going to recommend it. Although, you can easily get it. 8 out of 10. Domination with the Dolmre also works, and you have the Grand Master's Chapel, which will give you gigantic armies, but again, I feel that it's not really the sieve's flavor, so 8 out of 10. Diplomacy, as always, is the weakest route. You don't generate too much gold, and it's important for a Diplo victory to have gold. But you also have production and faith units for military emergencies. So I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10 here. The Kamai are in S tier Civ. I do miss their old Relic minigame to a degree, but they were so overbuffed with so many yields coming off of one or two districts that they might be the best Civ in the game. Or at least that was true until Yongla came out, who gets all these yields without districts. So, I love the Kamai, they are fun, and if you haven't won a game with them post rework, you gotta give them a try, cause you're not going to be disappointed. Thank you everybody for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!